The way you are able to experience this video right now is through three main components. The first component is your eye, which is capturing energy in the form of different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation emitted by your screen. The second component is your ear, which is capturing energy in the form of sound waves. This information is then sent to the third and most important component, your brain. It attempts to make sense of both the audio and visual information that you have received and interprets that to become part of your experience of reality that you are having at this very moment in time. But the synesthetes, they would actually experience this video in an unusual way. Some synesthetes would perceive the letters in this video to be three-dimensional objects. They would pop out from their place. Some synesthetes would perceive the letters to have a particular color to them. Some synesthetes would do that to the sound that they are hearing. And some synesthetes can even taste what is being said. Synesthesia has been confirmed by comparing the brain activity of synesthetes as well as their behavior to that of ordinary individuals. The problem is now we enter the realm of consciousness because it is very difficult to actually say that synesthetes or any other individual for that fact have the same experience as someone else when it comes to the way they perceive reality. For a discussion on the nature of consciousness itself, I have another video on the subject where I address the problem that I mentioned. For the sake of this video, we are going to assume that the way synesthetes, extraordinary individuals, experience reality is in fact an extraordinary way of experiencing reality. And at the same time, we're going to assume that ordinary individuals, let's say like me, experience reality in an ordinary way similar to other ordinary individuals. So with that out of the way, the reason I am mentioning synesthesia is because it presents a number of interesting questions about the nature of reality and our perception of such reality. There are two main components when it comes to perceiving anything, the capturing of information and the processing of such information. In the case of living organisms, let's say humans for example, there are certain parts of our body that can capture information from reality and then that information gets processed by the brain and turns it into the reality that you are experiencing. Here is the issue. If something goes wrong with the capturing of information or something goes wrong with the processing of information, then it would make sense to say that your experience of reality is wrong. Your brain corrects the information that you receive all the time without consulting you at all. One of the ways it does that is through something called neural adaptation. If you were to wear goggles that flipped your field of view upside down 180 degrees and you were to wear those goggles for about a week or so, then your field of view will flip back to normal. This is so effective that pilots who wore those types of goggles actually managed to fly and land airplanes the way they always flew and landed airplanes. That is not the only thing that changes what your reality looks like from that of actual reality. The other thing that changes it is the rejection of information. Your brain does not process all the information that it receives or it chooses not to. One of the ways that it does that is through something called sensory gating. For example, your natural smell is no longer part of your reality unless you really try to get that information by doing that. Then in that case, then you will be able to smell it. Otherwise, it goes directly into an information garbage pile. If information does not get filtered out properly, it can actually create problems such as sensory overload or in worst cases, attention deficit disorder and schizophrenia. Sometimes things can get really weird as the processing of information becomes a jumbled up mess. Hallucinations, whether caused by drugs or as a side effect of a disease, as well as the wide ranging set of mental disorders are an example of this. Worse yet, dreams are a case where an individual's perception of reality becomes completely different than their everyday waking reality. All of this points to one thing. If there could be errors in the way we experience reality, then chances are our experience of reality, whether it is my reality or your reality or any other individual's reality, is not likely to be a reflection of actual reality. 
Evolutionary speaking, you might think that this makes no sense. If ordinary individuals, the way they experience their reality is not that of actual reality, then there will be problems in the chance of them surviving. If there is a tiger and they experience this tiger as not being a tiger about to pounce on them, then that is a problem. If they are about to pick a plant and eat whatever is on the plant and that plant is not a reflection of actual reality, then that is going to be a problem. So it is in fact the case that if we experience reality close to that of actual reality, that our chances of survival would increase, right? In a recent TED talk, cognitive scientist Donald Hoffman explained that this might not be the actual case. He gave a very good analogy relating to computers. I, as an ordinary individual, let's say I am an ordinary organism, only need to know how an operating system works in a computer. I don't need to know the zeros and ones and the layers of code that make the operating system function. And this is the same case when it comes to my experience and reality and whether it reflects that of actual reality. I don't need to know what is there in actual reality as long as my own reality increases my chances of survival. Evolution favors fitness not matching your reality with that of actual reality. I would highly suggest watching the TED Talk if you want to find out more about this subject. But there's a bigger problem at play here. At least there is the fact that, you know, I think, therefore I am. I have my own reality and I experience that reality. Whether it is a reflection of true reality or not, it doesn't matter. I have my own reality and you have your own reality. If we follow that logic, then another question comes up. If we remove everything that can capture and process information that includes living organisms, which include humans, and even things like computers, the question that comes up is this, without anything to perceive, is there anything to be perceived? If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? There is another way to phrase what I just mentioned and it's probably a question that you've heard of before. Although I would argue there are still other living organisms near the tree which can process the information from the tree so that information is still accessible in some way. In order to find truly inaccessible information or to put it more correctly, in order not to find any information about a particular thing, we need to go beyond the tree, beyond Earth, beyond the solar system and even beyond the galaxy much, much further away than here. This depends on how fast information is traveling, where it started traveling, and when it started traveling. Information that travels at the speed of light, let's say light and gravitational waves, have to be at a maximum distance of around this many light years if that information was emitted very early on in the history of the universe. If this information, speed of light information, such as light and gravitational waves, started traveling right now, right this very moment, they need to be at a maximum distance of around this many light years in order for that information to reach us. This is due to the accelerating expansion of the universe, which is stretching space itself. This expansion is actually going to make the amount of information that we will be able to realistically observe to become less and less over time. For example, the cosmic microwave background, which allows us to know certain things about the early universe, is going to become increasingly redshifted. And then the information about it will become inaccessible. The problem will become so bad that as our galaxy is merging with other galaxies in our local group, other galaxies will start to be pushed away by the expansion of the universe until the information gets stretched out so much that we no longer have access to that information. However, that does not mean that information has disappeared. No, the information is still there. It's just that it's so far away that it is essentially impossible to access that information. The very fact that the amount of information we will be able to realistically observe is going to become less and less over time gives us the ability to say confidently there is a very good likelihood that there is information outside our horizon and there is probably a lot more than what we can only observe. Let's say that there is an alien civilization that exists right now and they've sent a signal right now and they exist right now 17 billion light years away from Earth. That is beyond the horizon that I've mentioned earlier. So that signal will never reach us and our signals will never reach them. However, if we go with the logic earlier, we would not exist to them and they would say we do not exist for them. But in the grand scheme of things, we do both exist in the universe, even though we can never actually perceive each other at all. 
But the real question here is, is there a way to figure out what actual reality looks like? Imagine that you are an outside observer observing the entire universe. You can see both us and the alien civilization that is inaccessible to us 17 billion light years away. And you can see all other civilizations as well. Is it possible to really tell what this actual universe looks like even though we are prisoners in our own reality? Is it possible that we can become outside observers of the universe itself? The answer seems to be closer to no than it is to yes. To give you some perspective for why this is the case, let's use video games as an example. Imagine that you are a character in a video game. I'm using a game called World of Warcraft as an example. Imagine that you're trying to figure out what makes this world work. For example, you're trying to figure out how magic works, how movement works, and so on and so forth. You're trying to understand the physics that allow the game to function. You make some experiments within the game and then you find what makes those things work. But then you hit a snag. Because you are a character within what is essentially this micro universe, it's going to be very difficult for you to understand why things work the way they do within your own universe. Let's say that you discover how magic works, let's say you discover how movement works, but then can you really discover that this movement and magic system is based on the way it was programmed using the game's engine? How do you do that? Let's say that you run a series of very advanced experiments and you figure out the code within the game engine that allows magic and movement to happen. How do you now understand that the game engine has been created using layers of code? And this becomes worse and worse as you dig deeper and deeper and deeper. What makes things worse is that you as a character within this video game, you have a warped sensation of reality. You take information from this video game and then you have your own reality about such a video game. It's going to be very difficult for you to understand that at the very bottom, the fundamental thing that makes your world works is a series of organized zeros and ones. However, to an outsider's perspective, let's say the developers, for example, they will be able to immediately tell what your actual reality is based on. But then you face another problem. Let's say that you did in fact learn from your own micro universe that the fundamental thing that makes the world works are a series of zeros and ones. You are now probably the most influential individual in that video game, this micro universe. You've discovered the fundamental thing that makes the universe works. You have a theory of everything. The problem is this. How can you tell that these series of zeros and ones are not based on something else? How will you be able to tell that they are connected to a series of on and off switches that exist outside your universe, outside your reality? So basically, you would have to figure out how this macro universe works. The universe that includes the developers of the video game that you live in, this micro universe. And all of that has to be done within a warped sensation of reality. You would have to figure out that transistors are made up of atoms. Then you would have to figure out what atoms are made of, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then you would have to dig even deeper and deeper and deeper. And you have to figure out the fundamental thing that allows this macro universe to function. And since we ourselves don't know that yet, that is a problem. Now that last part isn't exactly true. There are several proposed theories that propose the fundamental thing that allows our universe to be what it is. Not the micro universe that you live in, the video game that you live in, but the macro universe that allows your own micro universe to exist. The strongest candidates are several variants of a theory called string theory, which proposes that the fundamental thing that allows our universe to be what it is are a series of vibrating strings. Depending on the way they vibrate, they have a different effect on the universe. Now let's say that we find conclusive evidence that says that our universe is in fact based on a series of vibrating strings. Here is the thing. How can we be sure that the evidence that we've collected is actual evidence that reflects actual reality if our perception of such reality is warped? And even if it is the case, how can we be sure that these vibrating strings are the last fundamental level in the universe? Are we sure that there is no transistor to these strings? In the same way that there is a transistor to the zeros and ones that make up a micro universe like a video game? Some say we should just stop at a certain point. If we figure out that the fundamental thing that allows our universe to work are in fact a series of vibrating strings and we've done that within our own perception of reality, that's it. 
it matters to us because that is the case within our own perception of reality. The same is true for a character in a video game. If it figures out that the fundamental thing that allows its universe to work are a series of zeros and ones, that's it. It doesn't really need to know more than that. But there is only one argument. What do you think? Is there a way to figure out what actual reality looks like? And is there a way to figure out what makes up that actual reality? Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.